Let's solve the free particle in one dimension. This problem is a problem where I have a particle of mass m moving in one dimension, we'll call it the x dimension, and that it's moving in a constant potential. So here's my particle. Particle has mass m. It moves only in one dimension, again, the x direction. And it could be anywhere from x equals negative infinity to positive infinity. We start by writing down the Schrodinger equation, h bar squared over 2 times the mass times the second derivative of the wave function with respect to x plus the potential times the wave function is equal to the total energy times the wave function. Now I wrote the derivative as a normal derivative in this case because this is a problem in one dimension. I don't have any other variables except for x, and so I can write just a normal derivative. I don't need to write a partial derivative. And I wrote the general form of the potential as being a function of x, but in this particular case, we know that the potential is actually a constant in x, and so when I move the potential to the right side of the equation, I'm going to rewrite it as just a constant. So let's go ahead and do that, moving that potential to the right side of the equation. So my first term stays the same. This is equal to the total energy minus the potential energy times the wave function. And now let's multiply both sides by negative 2 times the mass divided by h bar squared. So I have my second derivative on the left side of this equation all by itself. So all I've done is rewritten the Schrodinger equation and by rearranging it and writing the potential as a constant. At this point, it's convenient to define a constant k, where this constant is equal to 2 times the mass divided by h bar squared times the total energy minus the potential. And then we're going to take the square root of this whole thing. And when I do that, I can rewrite my second order differential equation. That is my rearranged Schrodinger equation as being the second derivative of the wave function with respect to x is equal to negative this constant squared times the wave function. So to solve this, what I need to do is just look for functions that when I take their second derivative, I get the function back times a negative constant. So there's actually several functions that will do this. One is sine of kx Another function is cosine of kx. Another function that works is e to the i kx. And yet another function is e to the minus i kx. So let's just substitute in sine of kx to show that it actually solves the Schrodinger equation. So if I take the second derivative of sine of kx with respect to x, what I do first is I take the derivative with respect to x. When I take the derivative of sine of kx with respect to x, I get k cosine of kx. And I still have to take the derivative one more time. And when I take the derivative again, k is just a number, but the derivative of cosine of kx with respect to x is negative k sine of kx. So I'm going to get a negative k coming out, which gives me a k squared and a negative, and I get my sine of kx back. So by taking the second derivative of sine of kx, I get sine of kx back times negative k squared. So sine of kx does indeed solve this second order differential equation. It's a eigenfunction of the Schrodinger equation. You can do the same thing for cosine of kx and also show that it's an eigenfunction of the Schrodinger equation. So the general solution would thus be that the wave function is equal to some constant times sine of kx plus a different constant times cosine of kx, where a and b are constants that we would determine by applying the boundary conditions for the specific problem. In this particular case, we have a free particle. There are no boundary conditions, 
So A and B are arbitrary. I also mentioned that e to the ikx and e to the minus ikx are solutions to the Schrodinger equation. Let's show that for the case of e to the ikx. So we're going to do the same thing that we did earlier, and that is we're just going to plug in this potential solution, e to the ikx, into our differential equation and see what we get. So let's take the second derivative of e to the ikx. When I do that, I get... Hmm, I'm going to take the derivative twice, and each time I take the derivative of e to the ikx, I'm going to get a factor ik times e to the ikx. Since I take the derivative twice, I get the factor ik twice, so I'm going to square ik, and I get back e to the ikx. Of course, ik squared is equal to negative 1, that is, i squared is negative 1, times k squared. So I get minus k squared times e to the ikx. That is, when I plug e to the ikx into this second order differential equation, I get e to the ikx back times a negative constant. So e to the ikx is also a solution. And I can write the general form of the solution as a constant times e to the ikx plus another constant, let's say d, e to the minus ikx. And that's another general solution. And either one of these works just fine. Sometimes the solution in terms of the exponentials, e to the ikx and e to the minus ikx, is convenient. Because it turns out that e to the ikx and e to the minus ikx are eigenfunctions of the momentum operator. And what we see is that the first term represents the part of the wave function that is the particle moving to the right with momentum h bar k. And that the second term in this general wave function is the part of the wave function that is the particle moving to the left with momentum negative h bar k. This example illustrates a couple of key points. It's the easiest problem in quantum mechanics. It's the easiest case to solve. I have a constant potential with no boundary conditions. I get two potential solutions, one in terms of sine and cosine, and a completely equivalent one in terms of e to the ikx and e to the minus ikx.